Grace and peace, Brother Sean here with another revelation of Jah's calendar. I want to give all praise and glory to Jah our Father and His Son Joshua the Messiah, our Savior, also known as Jesus the Christ, Yahshua HaMashiach, for dying for our sins and giving us the opportunity to have eternal life with them. As we get into this lesson here, it's repairing the Sabbath breach series that I've been talking about lately. And we're going to look at the 24 hour Sabbath. It's from evening to evening. Now, in warfare or agriculture, a breach is a place where the enemy comes in to destroy or where the animals break out and get lost. And every farmer knows repairing breaches, broken fences, walls, padlocks is a never ending task. And no matter how well built a fence may be, there will come a time when it will need to be repaired. Now when we look at this word breach in the dictionary, it means a breaking of or failure to observe law or contract, the act or result of breaking, break or rupture, an infraction or violation as of a law, trust, faith or promise, a gap made in a wall, fortification, line of soldiers, etc., a rift, a severance of friendly relations. So when we look at this word breach, you can see that it has many definitions. But the one I want you to focus on is the breaking or failure to observe law or contract. It's an infraction or violation. And this is what we're talking about when we come to the seventh day Sabbath. Now if domestic cattle, sheep, goats, cows are kept, then the need to repair breaches is all the more urgent because these creatures will break out as sure as day follows night. And in spiritual matters, a breach in a defensive wall is even more serious because it lets Satan in and encourages Jah's sheep to stray away from the truth. It'll lead them to breach or break Jah's spiritual law and it's also an invasion on Jah's property. Now unless there is restoration and maintenance, all material things will deteriorate, decay and eventually fall apart. In other words, in the physical universe around us, the work of restoration and repair is absolutely essential or else deterioration, decay and death will result. And in the book of Isaiah, the Almighty calls certain believers, builders of old waste places, repairers of the breach restorers of paths to dwell in. So let's get a read. Isaiah 58, it reads, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of Jah, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in Jah, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of Jah has spoken it. Now when we look at these verses, they're very serious. We can see in verse 12 that there's something here about a breach. And in verse 13, we can see that it's dealing with the Sabbath day. Now I know more times people only think about the Sabbath as a day to get together and not to work. But this day is holy. And when we look in verse 13 very carefully, we see that we're not supposed to have our own words, right? Nor speak our own words nor do our own thing, our own pleasures. This is very serious because a lot of times I hear people talk about, you know, in the nighttime, you know, you, you don't normally work and all of that. But the thing is, if you do your own thing on the Sabbath, whether you're watching TV, sports, hanging out with friends, playing games, and just worldly socializing or speaking of things of the world, you are defiling the Sabbath. The Sabbath is very serious and I hope you get that from this lesson. Now ever since the beginning, Satan has endeavored to break into the Most High's spiritual territory and lead his people astray. Satan's greatest delight is to make breaches in Jah's fences and walls, whether they be in his laws, commandments and doctrines, or within a congregation, even with potential believing families and lives, or even casting doubt in the professed believer's individual mind. 
These are his tactics. The Sabbath is no exception. Now without a doubt, Satan will break in and cause chaos, confusion, separation, sorrow, and death. He is intent on fulfilling his goals and missions. He is the unholy spirit that has motivated most of mankind and oppresses and misrepresents the Most High's word, love, law, commandments, and testimony. The seventh-day Sabbath, which is the prime example of Jah's salvation and rest, has been continually attacked by Satan from the beginning. Ezekiel 22.8 reads, Thou hast despised my holy things, and has profaned my Sabbaths. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed the difference between the clean and unclean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. So as you can see when we look at these Ezekiel verses here, it also complements those Isaiah verses because people and teachers are profaning the Sabbath day. People are teaching that the Sabbath is only 12 hours or that you don't even have to keep it anymore or that it begins with the light time and then the evening. All of these are pollutions of the Most High Sabbath. And I want to be a repairer of these breaches. And as I talk about these things, I'm going to put it out there. Can you be a builder of the old waste places? Are you willing to be a repairer of the breach? A restorer of paths to dwell in? So this is the question. What side are you on? I would just encourage you that you be a builder and a repairer of the Sabbath breach. And you should join us and be fellow repairers of the breaches of just holy times. Now I want to quote something and it's very important. It comes from this book, The Last Day Events, on page 225. I don't know who the author is, but it reads, God has given men the Sabbath as a sign between him and them as a test of their loyalty. This is true. Those who, after the light regarding God's law comes to them, continue to disobey and exalt human laws above the law of God in the great crisis before us, will receive the mark of the beast. This is true. So let's look at this sign in the book of Exodus. Exodus 31, it reads, And Jah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am Jah that doeth sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defiles it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever does any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the Sabbath, seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to Jah. Whosoever does any work, work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. That word perpetual means forever. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days Jah made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So we see here very, very clearly that the Most High is serious about his Sabbath day. So again, we come to this question, is the Sabbath 12 hours or 24 hours? Now, with, without a doubt, you know I teach it's 24 hours. And I know when we look back in the past, the movement of the sun was the first, you know, was first measured in degrees on the sundial during the daytime. So sundials were used. And I want to quote a verse from that in the book of Isaiah chapter 38. It reads, And this shall be a sign unto thee from Jah, that Jah will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backwards. So the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it was gone down. 
So when we look at this verse, we can see a couple of things. We do know that, like I said, it was sundials that were used to measure the daylight season. And we see here also that it talks about the sun moving and returning. I do believe truly that the sun and the moon and stars move around the earth. And the earth does not move at all. It's fixed in its set position. Now, when it came time to the Messiah, up in those times, in the Roman times, we know that hours were being measured out differently. Joshua answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he sees the light of this world. And, I, and as, as I've been saying for many times, you know, over many videos, people want to say that, hey, this is the verse here that establishes what the, uh, the real original day is, because it says it's twelve hours in the day. However, when we go to verse 10, we see, But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. So again, when we look at these verses and everything in context, the Most High wasn't talking about how many hours are in a day. However, though, it's okay if you want to use them, but it speaks of the daylight season and also the night season. And what a lot of people don't know is that in the nighttime, throughout the scriptures from the time of the Messiah, hours were counted. They were counted in the night, and evening was equal to 6 p.m. Acts chapter 23, verse 23, it reads, And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready, make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen threescore and ten, which is seventy, and spearmen two hundred, at the third hour of the night. So we can see here that in the time of the Messiah and in the New Covenant times moving up, that hours were also counted in the night. So again, when we look at this 12-hour Sabbath, it's only 12 hours or in the daylight only, and you compare it to the 24-hour Sabbath, there's no comparison. Just from creation, we can see that the Most High made a 24-hour day from day one. We can see that He established His weekly cycle with the Sabbath. And we can see that it starts from the evening and the morning. And for those who teach that it's a 12-hour Sabbath only and you don't observe the evenings, that's not good. And I'm not going to judge you, but that doctrine is very false. Now, as I cover this topic, I've already covered the first 24-hour day of creation a few times already. But in this lesson, we're going to look at the Day of Atonement and the Sabbath of Rest, the connection. We're going to look at the aspect of working in the day and night. We're going to look at the 24-hour day and the scriptural year as they relate to each other. I'm going to read Nehemiah and the 24-hour Sabbath, which is a very popular verse. However, we're going to give it a clean read, and it proved very clearly that the Sabbath begins in the evening. And also we're going to quote the book of Judith and the 24-hour Sabbath. And as you know, I've already covered Exodus chapter 16, the manna and the 24-hour Sabbath, which many people tend to use. That's right. You know, in my last video regarding Exodus 16, I showed very clearly that from the 15th to the 21st, which was that first week of the manna and how it was fulfilled, it began with the Most High giving quails in the evening and the manna always fell in the evening. And as we know, when it came to the sixth day, the Most High gave them double manna and also they reaped double manna. And we see in the seventh day that the Most High, during the night time, he had no manna falling, and therefore there was no manna to be gathered. And this clearly shows that the, there was 24-hour days and that the Sabbath was a 24-hour observant as well. However, still many people get confused on this topic. So let's just get into this thing here. Again, reminding ourselves that this Sabbath that we're talking about is 24 hours, beginning in the evening. Some would say, you know, sunset. But just using our clock, I would just use it for this, uh, an understanding. It's 6 p.m. And you can see starting at the bottom, it's evening or night. And then we have the 12-hour night season with the 6th hour being midnight. And then we have the morning beginning at 6 a.m. or sunrise, depending on the season. And that lasts for 12 hours. And the sixth hour of the, su of the sunlight time is midday as well. This is something that should be established in our mind very clearly. And this is how the first day works. And then when we look at it and we just, you know, look at all the days of creation, we can clearly see that there's seven 24-hour days of creation and that the Sabbath is a part 
of that first weekly cycle. However, let's get into some more talk. Let's look at the Day of Atonement, a Sabbath of rest. So when is this date of the Day of Atonement? And I'd like to bring out the aspect of date because a lot of people forget that a date has to be 24 hours. It doesn't matter which way you want to look at the word Yom. Once the word Yom is combined with any number, it means a 24-hour period. So let's get a clean read. Leviticus 23, verse 26 it reads, And Jah spake unto Moses, saying, Also, on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be in holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls, an offering, an offering made by fire unto Jah. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before Jah your El. So when we look at these first couple of verses here, we see that it's the tenth day of the seventh month. That's a date. And it calls it the day or the Yom of atonement. And it's a holy convocation, again, which we fast. Verse 29, For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening shall you celebrate your Sabbath. Now this verse is very popular and many people know of it. But again, we're looking at this day and date. And we can see that in verse 32, that at the end of the ninth day, which is the evening, the ending of the ninth day, is also the beginning of the tenth day. And it calls it a Sabbath of rest. And it's from evening to evening. That's when you celebrate the Sabbath. But what a lot of people want to say about this is they say, hey, you know what? This is a special day and it doesn't reflect on the Sabbath. And we'll talk about that soon. And we're going to talk about the relation with the Sabbath and the 24-hour date of the Day of Atonement. We see that the date of atonement is clear. It's the 10th day of the 7th month. It's a full 24-hour day of fasting and no work from evening to evening. Everyone agrees on this. It's a 24-hour Sabbath of rest, just like the seventh day weekly cycle. So if you just want to look at how this might look on a day, we have the evening, the morning, and then the evening, covering ourselves from evening to evening, a 24-hour day. And this is the 10th day of Ethanim, the seventh month. It encompasses a night period and a daylight period. And this is the correct understanding. Evening until evening is this 24-hour date of the Day of Atonement. It's also the Day of Atonement. It's not just the light period. And many people know that. So even if we look at our calendar and we have the Day of Atonement here, we know that at the end of the ninth is when the Day of Atonement begins. And then at the other evening, the end of the tenth, that's when the fast is over. So no matter how we want to look at this, we should get a good understanding that it's from evening to evening. Believe it or not, there's some people that teach otherwise. So it reads in Leviticus 23, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month is a day of atonement. It's a holy convocation. It shall be a Sabbath of rest. And I want you to pay attention to that term, Sabbath of rest. You shall afflict your soul in the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening. So when we look at up top here, we have morning, evening, morning, and evening. Now this is the wrong understanding. People want to say, well, the ninth at evening is the beginning of the ninth, and then you're going to go to the morning, and then you're going to go to the evening of the tenth. But obviously, that makes no sense at all. So if you start your days with the daylight season and not with the evening, this scripture here goes completely against that. And actually, this blows up that whole theory of people teaching that light is the beginning of the 24-hour period. How we're supposed to see this very clearly is we have the evening beginning the ninth, we have the morning, then we have the evening ending the ninth, and then we have the tenth day, evening till evening, including a night and a light season, is the correct understanding. It's very clear. 
So again, when is this date and day of atonement? Let's go to Leviticus 16 just to confirm this so there's no questions. And I'm just going to read like the, the highlighted red parts. We have it's the seventh month. On the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all. Whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourns among you. That's right. If a stranger, somebody from another nation outside of Israel, wanted to worship the Most High, they would join the Israelite nation and they would keep all of the holy things that the Most High gave to the children of Israel. Verse 30, for on that day, that yam, shall the priest make an atonement. Verse 31, it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by statute forever. And then let's go to Numbers 29, it reads, and you shall have on the tenth day of the seventh month a holy convocation, you shall afflict your souls. So the reason why I'm going on about this is that you have to see that this day and date is similar. And again, all the days in the Most High, including 24-hour days, are actual dates. And every day in the creation week in Genesis chapter 1 is a date. The evening and the morning were day one. So again, we can see the Day of Atonement. It starts at the ending of the ninth day, which is the starting of the tenth day. It lasts from evening till evening. And everything here is 24 hours long. As I said, all dates are 24 hours long and includes the night. So again, when we look at this 24-hour day of atonement very clearly and easily, it starts in the evening. We have the night season of 12 hours. The morning comes. Then we have another 12 hours. Now again, when we're talking about 12 hours and 12 hours and 24 hours, during the year, the sun sets and rises at different times. But when you just keep a standard, you'll see that the 12 hours, just like in John chapter 11, is a simple standard for our mechanical clocks that we use today. But let's go on. Now, I want to emphasize that a night is a part of a scriptural 24-hour day because there's many people that say that a night is never called a day or it's not a part of the day. Well, let's take a look at what the scriptures say. Now, were these days spoken of below only referring to the daylight periods? Let's take a read. John 11, verse 39, it reads, Joshua said, the Messiah, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Master, by this time he stinks, for he hath been dead four days. Now we know that when she's saying four days here, he wasn't just dead for four daylight periods. This included the nighttime. Four 24-hour periods. Very clear. Numbers chapter 12, verse 14, it reads, And just said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that, let her be received in again. And Miriam was shut out from the camp seven days, and the people journeyed not till Miriam was brought in again. So when we look at this verse again, she's put out of the camp for seven days. That doesn't just mean seven daylight periods where she was gone for the day, and then they brought her in at the nighttime, and then in the morning she left again. I mean, that all sounds so silly. So when people are reading the scriptures and they want to argue about, you know, is the day a 12-hour period or a 24-hour period, just read the word day in context. Even if it's the word yam, it's used in context. And that's all you have to do to get a good understanding of the original and genuine day. But let's go to Exodus chapter 12. It reads, Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Now, obviously, when we're reading this thing here, we can see that the Most High wants us to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven 24-hour periods. You're not just supposed, supposed to eat the leaven in the day, daylight part, and then, you know, you can bring the leaven back in the nighttime. No, the leaven is supposed to stay out of your house for seven 24-hour periods, from the first day unto the seventh day. And this also means a week, not just any seven-day period, but an, a weekly cycle. Verse 18, it reads, In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread unto the one and twentieth day of the month at evening. 
So again, we have our days and dates. We have when you're supposed to begin at evening, which is the end of the 14th day. And for the seven days until the 21st day at evening, you're supposed to have all leaven out of your house and you're only supposed to eat unleavened bread. This is important to know, 24 hour periods. It'd be silly if it was only speaking of just the daylight periods. Let's continue. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. So we can see again, this is referring to seven 24 hour days. Very, very clear. Jah himself says that the night is a part of a day. And again, many people say you'll never see the night be called a day in the scriptures. But that's not true at all. Exodus 12. For I, this is the Most High speaking, will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Jah. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to Jah throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So we see in Exodus chapter 12 here, and I just didn't read verse 13 because it doesn't you know, have any bearing, but please read all of Exodus 12. It will show you this thing very clearly. You notice that he says he's going to pass through this night, and then he's gonna, he says that this day shall be for a memorial. Well, maybe that's not enough. Let's continue. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of Jah went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto Jah for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of Jah to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. Now come on, let's take a look at this and be honest. We see here that he's calling the night time a day, which is nothing wrong with that. But if you want to be specific, you would say the day in terms of the light time. But we see this is a 24 hour period. Now I know what some people might say as well, even in regards to the day of atonement, they're going to be like, hey, those are special days. Those are the feast days, but it doesn't have anything to do with the seven day Sabbath. Well, I don't think you should be thinking that at all, because remember, the seven day Sabbath is the beginning of the holy days and the feast days of the Most High, of which we'll talk about a little later. Just as the night is a part of a day, Numbers chapter 8. For all the firstborn of the children of Israel are mine, both man and beast, on the day that I smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. Exodus 12.12 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Jah. Now, the reason why I put these verses together, line upon line, so you can see it says, On the day I smote every firstborn, and then when you go down to Exodus 12, this night will smite all the firstborn. There's no confusion here. The Most High is calling this night a day because it is. It's the beginning of a 24-hour period. So again, when we look at our 24-hour date and our day, it's very simple. From evening to the morning, back to the evening again. A full 24 hours. Darkness and daylight. But let's continue. The scriptures recognize the night as a part of the original genuine day as well. Let's look at this. This is very clear. Genesis chapter 15 verse 12 it reads, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he, Jah, said unto Abraham, Now I'm not going to read all of these words, but I'm going to put them on the screen for you to read, because this is what the Most High was saying to Abraham, but I want to get to the part that's dealing with the situation in verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So again, we're seeing here, in, up in verse 12, the sun was going down, and then in verse 17, we see that the sun was down. It went down, and it was dark. And look at verse 18 now. In the same day, Jah made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river of Euphrates. 
So again, we see here very clearly, the sun was down, it was dark, it was the evening, and it says in verse 18, that same day, the Most High made a covenant with Abraham. Very clear, reading it in context, nothing to be confused here. Even Jah's angels proclaim that Joshua's nighttime birth as a day or a day night. Look at this, Luke 2, verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of Jah came upon them, and the glory of Jah shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, the Messiah, the Adonai, the Anointed One, the Master, our Savior. So again, just looking at this in context, we see that they were out there in the nighttime, and an angel said, This day. Again, very, very clear. The Most High himself, out of his mouth, said that the nighttime was a day. We had the Abraham scripture where it was dark and it was called this day. We have the shepherds watching their flock at night and the angel said it was day. So we have the Most High, his angels, and now the Messiah. I don't know much how much more authority we need to understand this thing. So let's take a look. Matthew 26, verse 34. Joshua, Yahshua. Yahusha, Jesus the Christ, said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Let's continue. Luke 22, verse 34. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. So again, we see that there's a night, and he says this day. But some might say, well, you know, the cock is going to crow like in the daytime. So that's what he meant. All right, let's just get it summed up and clarified clearly all in one set of verses here. Mark chapter 14. And Joshua saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. And Joshua saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Now, brethren and sisters, this is very clear. This day, even in this night. So again, the Most High says it. Even if it's regarding the Most High's festival and Passover, it's, those are days that are set within just creation. But for some people, these things, you know, they overlook them. So again, I want to make sure you know that Jah's Sabbath of rest is a 24-hour Sabbath. Now I want to get to connecting all these dots that we spoke about before. The Sabbath is a feast as well as a holy day. Leviticus 23 it reads, verse 1, And Jah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of Jah, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of Jah in all your dwellings. So look at verse 3 clearly. It's six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. All right? And remember that term, Sabbath of rest. Verse 4, These are the feasts of Jah, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Now the rest of the chapter goes on to list all the annual festivals of the Most High. Their days of the week they start on, and the date, especially the dates. When we look at that chapter, Leviticus chapter 23, and please read it yourself, you can see that the seventh day Sabbath is also a date. The first day of Passover is a date. The seventh day of Passover is a date. The day of Pentecost or first fruits is a date. The day of trumpets is a date. The day of atonement is a date. And the first day of tabernacles is a date. 
and the eighth day of tabernacles is a date. All of these things in Leviticus chapter 23 are spoken of by day of the week and date. And you could also work it out with a few other scriptures because some scriptures might not be clear. But as you know, line upon line, here a little, there a little, you'll understand the truth. But let's get to another aspect of this, you know, this teaching here about the 12 hour Sabbath. Let's look at the day shift and the night shift. Yes, a lot of people want to say that, hey, you can't work in the night or the scriptures don't show anything about working at the night. So let's take a look. Now, as I'm saying here, many people see the following scriptures and come to the conclusion that in the ancient times, people didn't work at night. So that reflects on the beginning of the Sabbath. So, you know, when people would already come home, they would normally be resting in the nighttime. So, you know, why would the Most High have to tell them to rest in the nighttime? Because that's a time of rest already. But that's so silly and not true and complete at all. But let's get to these verses. John 9 verse 4 it reads, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So they quote this and they say, hey, look, it says when no man can work. But again, we know that the Messiah is not talking about literal working days. He's using these things as symbolism. Because when he's talking about the night can't work, he's talking about when he is gone. When the Messiah is gone, it's going to be dark. And we should know, from the scriptures it's very clear, people work in the night. And I'll prove that. But let's stick with this topic here, Judges 19. It says, Just then an old man came in from his work in the field at evening, who also was from the mountains of Ephraim. So in Judges here they say, look at that, he's coming from work in the evening. And in Ruth 2, it reads, So she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. So again they say, hey, look at that, she did her work until the evening time, because, you know, it was going to be dark and she couldn't glean in the night time. And then one of the most quoted ones is Psalms 104, verse 23. Man goes forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. So people say, hey, you see it there? Man works in the daytime. And so in the nighttime, in the evening time, you know, that's when you naturally rest anyway. So the Most High wouldn't tell you to keep the Sabbath in the nighttime when you're already resting. But that is so far from the truth. And what I want to do is I want to read the Psalms 104 in its context. Because when you read it in its context, it says something a little bit different. Let's take a look. Psalms 104, verse 20. This is what it reads. Thou, the Most High, makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their meat from El. The sun arises. They gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. So what the Most High do is uh, doing here, or I should say the psalmist is speaking about what the Most High is doing. He's talking about the wonderful things of the Most High. How He makes things darkness and the nighttime, and then the animals go forth. They go forth to feed their young and everything. And then when the sun arises, they get themselves together and they go back to sleep. And then in verse 23 it says, Man goeth forth unto his work and, his, and to his labor unto the evening. So the Most High is really saying here is this showing us, hey, you have the nighttime when the beasts are doing these things, and then in the daytime when man goes to work. What a wonderful thing. Verse 24 says, O Jah, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So you see, when you read this thing in context, actually from verse 20 through to verse 23, it's showing you a 24-hour day again. It's giving you the nighttime first, and then talking about the daylight after. And it's not just saying man goes to work and, you know, he only works to the evening and that's it. The wisdom is how the nighttime is for the animals and the daytime is for man. And that's why verse 24 is, you know, exhorting us to, you know, understand the great wisdom of Jah, how he does things in order. So anyways, let's move on. And I'm going to show you a few things. I have not seen in the scriptures that people don't work at night. Now working in the night in these modern times is much more common maybe than in ancient times, no doubt. But there were still night workers back then. This is something we have to kind of understand. I mean, just use your wisdom. You think everybody, when they would come home at night, that was it, everybody went to sleep and, you know, at six or whatever, stayed in their house and until the day? That's silly. 
See, when Josh says six days shalt thou labor, he was not saying that we can't work at night, but that he gave us six 24-hour days to do our work and our pleasure. And the seventh day is his day. So again, think about it. Even if you come home at the night time, you don't automatically rest. You might rest from your, your work day, but maybe you might have housework to do. You might want to just relax and, you know, hang out with friends, check other people in the night, do, you know, normal things of the world. But this has to stop on the seventh day Sabbath. If you remember the verses we spoke about earlier on in Isaiah, we don't speak our own words nor do our own pleasure. So again, just focusing on if you work in the day and then the night time is just you naturally rest. No, you still can do things. Most people, you know, especially nowadays, they don't go to sleep at 6, 6 p.m. when it turns dark. They have their dinner time. They do all kind of things, watch TV, internet, socialize, go do things, could even do some shopping. All kind of things can go on in the nighttime. So it's really silly just to focus on that, to try to use that to defend a 12-hour Sabbath. Workers of night shifts regularly have the daylight season off and rest, then go to work at night. Come on, that happened even in ancient times. People try to say it's only now. I mean, when we read that verse about the, the third hour of the night, it was about soldiers. Police work at night, firemen are working at night. All kind of things are going on at night that people have to, you know, work to keep our society going on. So think about this. Is the Sabbath one-seventh of Juz week? Or is it one-fourteenth? No, the Sabbath is one-seventh of Juz week, not one-fourteenth at all. So if we just want to look at, you know, the daylight season only and ignore the night, well, if you look at it fully, you're going to have 14, you know, cycles you can have a seven night cycles and seven light cycles which is 14 but then you're only going to rest on the, the seventh light cycle well that's 1 14th just as he gave us six days to work you understand and do our thing again it's, it's very clear let's read it in exodus 20 the commandment remember the sabbath day to keep it holy six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work but the seventh day is the sabbath of jah thy el in it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days Jah made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore Jah blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. So we can see very clearly he gave us six days to do our thing, not just the daylight time. And I know some people try to teach that this six, this six days or seven days of creation are 1,000 year periods. But that is not so at all. That's not true. We have a 7,000 year cycle of creation that we're in now, of which we're in the year 6,221. But Jah didn't take 6,000 years to, to make the creation and then rest it on for a 7,000 year and then tell us to rest for a 24 hour period. No, he made everything in six days, as it says very clearly, and he rested. That's why we rest. We rest within him. But let's continue. Again, the Sabbath is one-seventh, right, of Jah's week, not one-fourteenth. Just think about it. Luke 5, it reads, And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So we know toil means work, and especially fisherman work. It, it's very, you know, um, physical that way. But it says that they were working in the night. Come on. John chapter 21. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Luke 5 verse 5. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. Luke 2 verse 8 it reads, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. They were working at the night. And even when the, the sheep would be having babies and baby lambs, they would be there to help them do their thing. They're working. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9 it reads, For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, 
because we would not be chargeable unto, uh, unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of Elohim. So this is very clear. It says that he was working night and day. And that doesn't just mean um, he's working on the most highest things. No, it says because we would not be chargeable unto you. So it's saying that they wanted, you know, Paul here wanted to work so that the people wouldn't have to feel like, you know, he would have to feel like the people were supporting him. And finally, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, it reads, verse 8, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, for nothing, but wrought, or worked with labor and travail, night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Again, it would be very silly for us to think that, you know, from the scriptures, there's an understanding that nobody works at the night. I mean, if you even think about farmers, you know, farmers do their thing in the day, but in the nighttime, it could be very busy for them as well. They got other things to do as well. And again, just think about it. It's not just about work in the nighttime. It's about where your mind frame is at. You might be doing worldly things, but the Most High has commanded you that night, that evening there, to stay away from your own words and your own pleasures. It's very, very serious. Think about this too. We become clean by washing in the evening as well. Leviticus 22 verses 6 and 7 it reads, And the soul which hath touched any and the soul which hath touched any such shall be unclean until evening, and shall not eat of the holy things unless he washed his flesh with water. Verse 7. And when the sun is down, he shall be clean, and shall afterward eat of the holy things, because it is his food. So what do we see here then? Somebody, if they're unclean, they're unclean until the evening time. And then when the sun is down in the evening, they'll be clean. They have to bathe, as it says, and then they'll be clean. Why? Because it's the beginning of a new day and the ending of another one. And notice that if it's reflecting on the priests here, it's about eating of the holy things. Again, a meal. So he has to be clean, and in the evening, he's allowed to eat of that meal. Let's look at Leviticus 11. It reads, and for these ye shall be unclean. Whosoever touches the carcass of them shall be unclean until the evening. And whosoever beareth out of the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. So again, it must be very clear that we become clean in the evening time after we've bathed and so on and so forth. Especially we can see this in the ancient times. So now we've covered that. I want to now focus again and tie these things up some more, the Sabbath day of rest. Exodus 31 we read, Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to Jah. Whosoever does any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. So my focus here is on the phrase, the Sabbath of rest. And again it says any work. In Exodus 35 it says the same thing about the Sabbath again. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to Jah. Whosoever does any work therein shall be put to death. Now, Leviticus 23, we read it already, but let's again put into context. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is a Sabbath of Jah in all your dwellings. And it's good to always remind ourselves that the Sabbath belongs to the Most High. But now let's look at the Sabbath of Atonement and the same type of wording here. In the same chapter of Leviticus 23 here that we got from the Sabbath one in verse 3 up above, in verse 32 it reads, Regarding the Day of Atonement, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening until evening shall you celebrate your Sabbath. So look at this. this. Up top, we see that the seventh day Sabbath is called a Sabbath of rest. Day of Atonement is also called a Sabbath of rest. And it even lets us know when we celebrate this Sabbath from evening until evening. In Leviticus 16, it echoes the same statement. In verse 31, it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by statute forever. So you should see this connection. The seventh day Sabbath of rest is from evening until evening, just like the Day of Atonement. They are all holy convocations. There's nothing like, you know, type of separate about the seventh day Sabbath from, 
you know, the annual festivals of the Most High, except that the, the seventh day Sabbath occurs every week. But these other festivals occur once a year, but they are all the same thing. The first day of Passover is a Sabbath of rest as well. It's a, it begins in the night. We can go through all the festivals. They are all the same. So I hope it's very clear to see that the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest. It includes the evening time or the night time and the morning time or the light time or evening until evening. That is very clear. But I want to bring a couple of more understandings out here just for those people who, you know, might need a little bit more information to debate with those or even to show other people who insist that we should only be keeping a 12-hour Sabbath in the light time. And I mean, let me stop and say this here for a second. Let's say, let's just say that the Sabbath of 12 hours was the true thing, right? Do you think that the Most High is going to be upset with those individuals who were keeping the Sabbath the night before and the 12-hour light Sabbath? So it's not like they're defiling the Sabbath. They're just almost like covering your bases, making sure that you are doing it for a 24-hour period. The Most High is not going to say, hey, you've been breaking my Sabbath. You were keeping it for a little bit longer. But now let's flip it on the other side of the coin. Let's say which we know the 24-hour Sabbath is the true thing from the evening to the morning and the evening to the evening, so to speak, 24-hour days. And those who keep a 12-hour Sabbath, the Most High is going to say to them, well, why didn't you keep the rest of you know, the Sabbath, the early part of it? Why did you defile it and do your own things on my Sabbath day? Because the nighttime is a part of the Sabbath. So really, just think about this. If you're keeping a 24-hour Sabbath, the Most High... <laughs> In any which way your bases are covered you're resting at the proper time but if you're only keeping a 12-hour sabbath you may be defiling you may be polluting and turning your face away from jah's true sabbath day that's something that you really got to consider everyone now let's move on i want to talk about the scriptural likening of one day being equal to one year prophetically unto jah this gives us some understanding to these important fundamental cycles of time. Numbers 14 it reads, After the number of days in which you search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities even forty years, and you shall know my breach of promise. So when I look at this verse here and understand the context, we know that there were Israelites all that went to go search out the land of Canaan, and they were gone for 40 days. Of course, we know they were, they were gone for the nighttime. They never went down there and then quickly rushed back into Israel for the nighttime and then went back out. They camped out for 40 days and that includes the night as well, 40, 24 hour days. But here's the focus I wanna look at. It says that each day is for a year. Now let's keep this thought in mind. And let's look at it as a day is likened to a prophetical year even so a year has the dark cold season of winter and the light hot season of summer just like an actual 24-hour day of the dark cool night season and the light warm daytime season see the seasons of winter and summer symbolize both darkness and light one year or night and light one day i hope you're making this connection the six month summer season is a time of much light compared to the darkness and the six month winter season is a time when the darkness is much more compared to the light. This is what I want to say because remember one day is like into a year. So you have a dark part and a light part. Just like in the 24 hour day you have a dark part and you have a light part. So just as the day has a night season and a light season, even so the year has a dark season of winter and a light season of summer. Let's read Genesis 8.22 one more time because I know I quote this almost in every video. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now what I've done for us here is just I've color coded these aspects of the seasons. So you can see in the blue, that's all the dark and the cold parts representing, you know, that part of a year or the part of a 24 hour day. And then in the yellow, dealing with everything, dealing with light. So when we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and we look at the first day, we see that we have darkness, night and evening. And we also see that there's light, day and morning. 
So again, just look at this, the pattern, the beautifulness of the Most High's things. Maybe I want to make it a little bit more clear. Let's take a look at another chart. So we have our 24-hour day, or you could even say our one year. And we're using Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 5, and that last verse I read, Genesis 8, 22. And when we gather all the words, we see that seed time, cold, winter, night, darkness, and evening all are first, coming first, or they represent the dark time. And then we see that the other half is harvest, heat, summer, day, light, and morning. So I hope you can see this very clearly that there is 24-hour days. The Sabbath is a 24-hour worship period as well. I mean, if we look at the one year and the one day concept, we have the winter, which is the evening. And you have the winter, rain and the cold. You have the spring, which is the midnight. Then you have summer, which is the beginning of morning, so to speak, in the year. The summer, dry heat. And then we have autumn, which is midday, dividing things into you know four seasons of the year even though there are two generally but when you're wise you know that each of those six month seasons are divided up into three months each so we have our night and we have our daylight again all these words that you see on the screen can be found within the first day and Genesis chapter 8 and they all fit perfectly in Jah's plan all right now I want to get into Nehemiah and the Sabbath now, I know a lot of people have talked about this, and I've even seen people talk against it and try to say that this supports a 12-hour Sabbath. Let's just get a clean read and get into it. Now, before we get into this, I want to talk about bringing no burden through the gates on the Sabbath. Jeremiah chapter 17, it reads, and this is important because it leads to the Nehemiah understanding. Thus saith Jah, take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do ye any work, but hallow ye the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their next step, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. So you can see, I'm telling you, the Sabbath day is very important. Not to supposed to be bearing any burden. You don't throw out your garbage or do any gardening or anything, any labor on the Sabbath. But we know that our people, very stubborn, and as it is back then, so it is today. People are still keeping a 12-hour Sabbath or they don't even want to keep the Sabbath that way and say you can worship on any day you want. Not so. Verse 24. And it shall come to pass, if you diligently hearken unto me, saith Jah, to bring in no burden through the gates on the city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day to do no work therein. So after coming here, it says to bring in no burden through the gates of the city on the Sabbath day, right? Don't bring any burden in on the Sabbath day. But if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. So a very serious set of verses as you can see here. Don't even bring, even as you enter into the city, don't come into the city on the Sabbath day with any burden. All right, so let's get into this. When does this 24 hour Sabbath day begin? Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 14. Remember me, O my El, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my El and for the offices thereof. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves, and lading donkeys, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, and I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. So we can see here they're doing all manner of things on the Sabbath that they shouldn't be doing. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that you do and profane the Sabbath day? Do you see how serious this was to Nehemiah? He clear out said it was evil 
And what I want to emphasize here is that people just think, oh, it's just, just a day. And, you know, if you just do a little thing here, a little thing there, you know, the Most High knows our heart and will forgive us. Listen, when we read the scriptures and you get a clean read, if you pollute the Sabbath, defile it, even if you know what it is, and you do your own pleasures, speak your own words, you are profaning the Sabbath day, and it's an evil thing. Never get that twisted. Verse 18. Did not your fathers thus, and did not our Elohim, bring all this evil upon us and upon the city? Yet ye bring, no more, bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Very serious. Let's continue. Nehemiah 13, verse 19. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates that should, there should be no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. All right. So let's just look at this carefully. It says, it began to be dark before the Sabbath. Some people are going to say, well, you know what? What he was doing, this is for those who profess a 12-hour Sabbath, he was just being extra cautious so that they wouldn't come in and set up and then, you know, on the Sabbath day, in the light time, you know, be profaning the Sabbath. But again, it says that it began to be dark before the Sabbath. And it says that the gates began to be dark and they were shut and not to be opened after the Sabbath. So again, when were the gates shut? As it got dark before the Sabbath. That's letting us know clearly, come on. The Sabbath starts in the evening, if you haven't got that already from all of this information. Anybody who tries to say, oh, that was something else, they're taking the scripture and they're just twisting it up to their own destruction. Verse 20, so the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without or outside Jerusalem once or twice. And then I testified against them and said unto them, why lodge ye about the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. So they were coming in that evening, sleeping in that night around the thing, just waiting for the Sabbath to be over, so to speak, or come in the next day. But it says they came no more on the Sabbath. No more on that night. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my El, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. Brethren and sisters, I echo that statement. I pray that the Most High remember me for trying to help set these things straight. Set the Sabbath day straight, set the calendar straight, set the holy festival straight. This is our job. And I pray that the Most High has mercy. So notice in verse 22, sanctify the Sabbath. Again, when did the gates have to be closed? The gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath. I commanded that the gates should be shut. Simple. The Sabbath was starting that evening. Again, many people say that he was just being extra cautious. So he did so 12 hours before. But that's just denying plain and simple reading. It began to be dark before the Sabbath began. Okay? So, I hope you got a little bit of an understanding, and I want to finish off with a few more things. This Judith chapter 8, it reads, And she fasted all the days of her widowhood, except the eves of the Sabbaths and the Sabbaths. So again, very clearly, there's an evening of the Sabbath and the Sabbath daylight part. It doesn't even say Sabbath day. You notice that? The eve of the Sabbaths and the Sabbaths. And the eves of the new months, wrongly called new moons, and the new months. And the feasts and solemn days of the house of Israel. So we see a couple of things again. There's an evening of the Sabbath. There's an evening of the new month. 24-hour days begin and end in the evening. And the feasts and solemn days of the house of Israel also begin in the evening as well too. You can look this up in the original 1611 here where you can see that it says save the evenings of the Sabbaths and the Sabbaths. Just so people don't think that I'm making up this quote. And remember, the Apocrypha was in the original 1611. So as we begin to come to a conclusion here, the scriptural weekly cycle with the scriptural times of the scriptural days and dates I want to make clear. So as we see, day one is beginning Saturday evening at 6 p.m., or you can say when the sun is set, 
until Sunday evening. Again, I use the clock because some places in the world the sun doesn't set for very late and some places it doesn't even set for three months or rise for three months. So when we use our clock and we can govern it by the 12 hours of day and light, we can see that it's an easy, good standard. So we go to day two, is Sunday evening at six, day three, gate four, all the way. And then when we get to day seven, the Sabbath, it begins Friday evening at six, or you can say sundown, right? Or the evening until evening, until Saturday evening at six, evening until evening. That's how the Sabbath should be kept. Do not just focus on a 12 hour Sabbath. Let me finish off with some powerful verses. Isaiah 56. Thus saith Jah, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that does this and the son of man that lays hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to Jah speak, saying, Jah hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. So again, this verse 3 is very clear. It let's us know that the Most High will accept the strangers or people of other nations if they join to Him. Because look at, the Most High is letting us know. This is coming from Isaiah himself. Let the son of the stranger say, Jah hath utterly separated me from his people. So even though the Most High gave salvation of Israel, He spoke to Israel, it's His chosen people, we know that. He has chosen no other nation. But what he has chosen though from those other nations are certain righteous individuals that want to join his covenant. And no teaching and nobody, no person can ever stop that from happening. And if they want to actually teach that no Gentiles, if they seek righteousness or of any nation can't get in unless they are a blood Israelite, I do pray that the Most High has mercy on us all and on Israel. But that's a false teaching. And of course, he's talking about the eunuch saying, Behold, I am a dry tree, meaning, you know, I have no offspring. So how is my name going to be carried on? Verse 4, For thus saith John unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than sons of and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Brethren and sisters, if you're an Israelite, you need to become a spiritually minded Israelite because not all Israel is Israel. Look at this, what it says there, a name better than son and of daughters. Come on, the Most High is not dissing his people at all, but he's just letting us know that it's righteousness, taking hold of his covenant, pleasing him, choosing these things. It's the Most High and the Messiah is the doorkeeper and he's gonna let in anyone. And he can raise up children of Israel from anything. So we, again, be very careful. But let's continue. Also, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to Jah, that serve him, and to love the name of Jah, to be his servants, everyone that keep the Sabbath from polluting it and take it hold of my covenant. Again, anyone who wants to teach that the strangers cannot get eternal life is teaching a false doctrine. Yes, the Most High is only for Israel, as I said, but the strangers join Israel. So simple, and that's throughout the whole of the Old Testament. Again, now if people don't know what salvation means, it's about eternal life. But for many carnal-minded people, they think salvation is dealing with finding a position in the world. That's far from what the Most High is teaching about salvation. However, though, I'll just leave it at this. The Sabbath is a 24-hour period of rest. It's not 12 hours. That's a false doctrine. And we must all keep the Sabbath. Keep it holy by not working. Don't speak your own words and talk about the worldly things. Don't do worldly things. Take the world out, right? All of these things, not just not working. Gather if you have people to gather with on the Holy Convocation. And remember, where two or three are gathered, there is the Messiah in the midst. And this is true. So I pray that you learn to keep the Sabbath. I hope this has put this to the rest. And remember, you could also check out the lesson I did on Exodus chapter 16, of which people use as well. Actually, that proves that days are 24 hours. But nonetheless, 
I just hope that you got a, a little bit of understanding, and I want to give all praise to the Most High Jah and His Son Joshua the Messiah. If you think this video has helped you in understanding, please like, and if you haven't subscribed to my channel, I would like you to subscribe, or if you don't want to subscribe, at least share this you know, video with people who you feel might need to get this understanding and show them what is the truth about this holy time. Shalom.